good morning and welcome again. Uh, when I agreed to speak, that, I got a hi, Lala, that's my niece. <laughs> hi, Madeline. <laughs> um, when I agreed to speak in chapel on Grandparents Day, I did so for two reasons. Uh, one, I knew that my grandparents would come from Mesa, Arizona, where they live. They are here today, Pastor Wally and Doris Robbins, and I can hardly say how glad I am that they could be here. And two, though I was told I didn't have to frame my chapel talk around anything grand parenty, uh, I knew I'd have plenty to say if I did. Because while I can't quite imagine constructing a theology of grand parenting or uh, finding how being grandchildren is, is an analogy for the Christian life, I can tell you that I've been well taught by my grandmother and my grandfather what it means to be brought into the family of God, and I can honor them today by reflecting with you on our salvation in these terms. My grandparents have shaped me in ways that I'll never be fully able to articulate. Uh, our most formative relationships are, of course, the least expressible. Still, let me share a few things. My grandpa, a pastor, when he retired for the first time, and he didn't stay retired for long, he continued pastoring about 15 years after his first retirement, he let sixth grade Melissa plunder his library, which he was downsizing, and uh, I got to uh, rummage through for books that I still have. If he didn't inspire, he certainly encouraged my appetite for reading and for study which is obviously a fixture of my adult life. My grandmother's inimitable kindness was a perpetual balm for a girl whose childhood was on the lonely side. Friday night sleepovers at grandma's with my going to, grandma, my gr going to grandma's tote bag um, filled what would have otherwise been a light social calendar in elementary school and maybe high school too. And on the lighter side, though uh, it's less significant to me, it has become a family joke how I seem to take my cue for all of my hobbies from my grandfather. Uh, chief among the ones I have committed to in the last few years are cycling and beekeeping. And I do take every opportunity to tell crowds of people um, that I keep bees, which I don't know why I think that's the sort of thing you should tell people if you want them to like you. <laughs> And my grandmother, who calls me regularly to read passages of a devotional book for grandmas that I gave her in 1996, and she still reads through every year, uh, she brings out my best affections, and in her precious self, she stands as a reprimand to my cynical disposition. Uh, what's more to the point today, uh, is that it seems clear to me that my grandparents are two of the most instrumental figures in my Christian testimony. They have taught me how good it is to be in the family of God, and they have shown me that it's an extraordinary work of God to use the ordinary means of our families to bring us to faith. And let me make this caveat, because I know that not everyone in this room has had good family experience as a background to their Christian life. To the extent that your family experience has been safe and good, I hope you hear today why being in the family of God is better by far. And to the extent that your family experience has been disappointing, please hear today the good news of your membership in a far better family, the family of God. Testimony is one of the subjects of my talk today. I used to regret mine. Growing up in a Christian home didn't have the spice I wanted in a personal narrative. I distinctly remember a bike ride with one of my sisters someday following testimony night in youth group, and we both were bemoaning our testimonies uh, in our naivete, and please know I recognize it as such now. We wished for something juicier, some greater sign that the God of the universe had in fact rescued us from darkness, sin, and death, and brought us into his marvelous light some greater sign than when my mother read me the story of Jonah in the belly of the whale, I repented of my three-year-old sins and <laughs> accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. The story, of course, 
in which any person can say she has been made a child of God is far grander than any juicy or boring testimony. It's the story of the world. It's the history of redemption. In the beginning of our story, God made Adam and Eve, and by Luke's account in the genealogy he gives in his gospel, Adam was a son of God. Our first parents, from whom the whole human race descends, were made, were created children of God. But in their disobedience, they transgressed this relationship that they were given. And as a divine consequence, they were cast out of their home, made aliens, strangers to the creator, having chosen to be orphans rather than children. And even as a natural consequence, it seems that the bonds of the natural family fell into ruin, since the scene that follows Adam and Eve's transgression is a fratricide, Cain murdering his brother, Abel. But the history of redemption is the story of God, the creator, becoming our father again in his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Calling Abraham to leave his father's land for a land that God would give him, commanding him to sacrifice his son Isaac, though he was promised descendants as numerous as stars, God promised him a family and an inheritance for that family that exceeded even the utter reaches of Abraham's imagination. As his descendants did multiply and grow into a people, God called them his own. Israel also was his son, and he worked wonders to bring them out of slavery into a land and life that he promised to his forefathers. Through the law, the prophets, kings and priests, God was leading this creature, his son Israel, toward Jesus. And in the fullness of time, the eternal son of God, the only begotten son, uh, the only son that is who is eternally the son of the father, the only son who was not created or made by the father, this son obeyed the father and took on human flesh, humanness, and was made like his brothers, the author of Hebrews says, that's us, his brethren, in every way. Christ became our brother so that we could become children of God. In his death, he satisfied the wrath of God that was due to us and broke the power of sin and death, and in his resurrection, he became the firstborn from among the dead so that we now can hope in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And when Jesus came, many of the children of Israel did not receive him as sent by God. But the father wasn't just intending to bring ethnic Israel into mature sonship by sending Christ. As John testifies, his own received him not, but to as many as received him, to them he gave, sorry, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God the Father was giving his rebel creatures a new birth, recreating humanity in God the Son. And he wasn't just disrupting biological family ties, or ethnic groups, or political society. He was going all the way back to our first parents, to Adam and Eve, in whom we all suffered the loss of an original sonship. Uh, here, I'll, I'll make an aside, um, because the point I'm, I'm wanting to make is that when we are made children of God, we have a relationship with God the Father that we do not have um, when we're born into the world. We don't have by virtue of our birth. Um, I, I got a puppy in this last year, and um, his name's Sam. And uh, two things, my niece, um, Madeline, hi again. Uh, <laughs> She, she likes me to, she calls me Sam's mommy, and she likes me to hold him and sing Baby Mine from Dumbo to him. Um, and when he does things wrong, like make a mess, she says, oh, his mommy's gonna be mad at him, and that's me. Madeline's the only person I will let call my dog, like my child. Um, she's the only one I really will let call me a dog mommy, because I'm not, and, and that's important to me. It's important to me <laughs> that no one thinks that I think that I've mothered um, a dog. <laughs> it's so important to me that when I go to the vet and they wanna call his name Sam Schubert, I ask at the counter that they not do that, that they just say Sam, because I think he's so much not my child that he doesn't have my last name. So, <laughs> 
I'm not quite godlike in this, and I don't think um, God disowns us, his creatures, in the same way. But I, but I wanted to put that out there as, as a possible. God is not our father when we are born. We are aliens and strangers. But there are two ways that the scriptures explain God does make us his children. One is that we're born again, and the other is that we're adopted. And these are not uh, given in any order in the scriptures. They are two ways in which we are called children of God. And here's the distinction. According to our new birth, God changes our very nature, making us into a new creation. And by this work, God restores in us our like, his likeness, our nature bears resemblance to our fathers. By the work of his spirit, he gives us new life. And according to our adoption, we're legally children of God. And this isn't second fiddle to nature. It's right alongside it. Rights and privileges and inheritance all come through our legal status as children of God. We can pray to God the Father because he is our Father in God the Son. He applies his almighty power to our care, and we will receive eternal blessing, the inheritance that the Father has for the Son, but now for all his children. And there are three things, if not more, that certainly come with our new family associations. Um, one is a changed relationship to God, and two is a changed relationship to the church, the people of God, and three is a changed relationship to sin. And we'll hear more about that in a moment. But I want to say to those of you who may hear these words and wonder why they don't entirely match your felt experience, that the witness of scripture is on your side in the tensions that you feel. For the ways that we do not feel in our nature that we are children of God because we know our own ungodliness, John says that we are God's children now, though we do not yet appear what we will be. When we finally behold Christ, we will be as he is because we will see him as he is. And for the ways that we do not experience the world with all the blessings of our adoption, Paul tells us that our lives are indeed characterized by groaning, by longing, by waiting for the full revelation of the sons of God. You're not alone in your groaning. The earth too groans. And what is more, the Holy Spirit joins our groaning. So neither our introspection nor our fleeting experiences in the world are the evidence to look to for our becoming children of God. One theologian puts it this way, to be a Christian is to believe that it is the Father who defines our identity when he says to us, this son of mine, this daughter of mine, to be a Christian is to believe that it's the father who defines our identity when he says to us, this daughter of mine, this son of mine. So indulge me while I read through a litany of the biblical testimony that the father is calling you his sons and daughters. Hear the witness of scripture, child of God. From Ephesians, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And more from Ephesians, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. From Romans, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And last from Romans eight, again, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Whatever my small testimony and whatever yours, it's the story of being brought into this cosmic and from the very beginning story of God rescuing his rebel creatures from slavery to sin and death and making us into sons and daughters in Christ Jesus. It's worth saying that there is in one sense only this story. But there are also as many testimonies as there are children of God. And in each of these stories, God uses various means to bring his creatures into his household. So back to grandparents. My mother's parents, the only grandparents I've known since my father's parents died before I could know them, are serious protagonists in, this, in my story whose first line is the formerly boring to me, I grew up in a Christian home. It turns out that even as seemingly simple, a situation as a Christian family has a thick history. I used to compensate for my uh, testimony envy by telling folk about my dad's conversion. He didn't grow up in a Christian home. He was a Jewish New Yorker, bar mitzvahed in the Bronx, and by his late 20s, he was a druggy hippie, deeply invested in the counterculture of the early 60s. But God, who is rich in mercy, saw fit to rescue him in such an extraordinary way that it still stops me in my tracks sometimes. His conversion was wild. It involved a bad drug trip in Berkeley, uh, his attempt to hitchhike to the Navajos because he believed they had it all figured out, um, some guys picking him up in this car that was all decked out, Jesus died for you. They offered him a place to live on a ranch, the Rising Sun Ranch, that's S-O-N. Um, <laughs> an altar call at a rural uh, church on a Sunday night and baptism in the Ely River by mountain men that looked just like I think John the Baptist must have. Meanwhile, back in New Jersey, my mother's parents, faithful pastor and his faithful pastor's wife, um, had raised my mother in a Christian home. Just after high school, she made her way from the East Coast to the West to join a church in Santa Barbara that was trying to get back to the roots of Christianity, living in common, fellowshipping daily. And my father and mother met here in that church at Isla Vista. They didn't date before they were married. They decided to get married and I think did so within a week. Um, my father's first proposal actually was a total flop. He asked her, what do you think of marriage? And it took her like an hour to figure out for sure he meant, do you want to marry me? Um, <laughs> and by then, the conversation was passed, you know? So second try, he, he, he sealed the deal. Okay, my grandparents weren't even able to travel to their daughter's wedding um, because my grandfather had just broken his Achilles tendon. Um, all this to say, their barely 19-year-old daughter married a 28-year-old ex-hippie new Christian. It may not be quite a parent's nightmare, but it's not without cause for alarm, right? <laughs> my grandma and grandpa welcomed my father into their family, believing that he had truly been born of God. And they loved him from the first so well and so deeply. I always used to love the Wild Berkeley part of my dad's conversion experience best, but now I think I love this part even more. In a conversation a few years back with my father about his conversion, we talked a bit about his own experience of his biological family, which was marked by sorrow because of the early death of his mother and his father's disinheriting him later in his life. My father's voice broke as he said, I was just a boy when my mother died, and we were quiet. And then he continued, but your grandmother was like a mother to me, and your grandfather for those first few years, I would just go and find him in the garage where he was working on his projects and I would stay there for hours, sometimes being quiet and sometimes peppering him with questions he was faithful to answer. I can't get over how good this is. My mother's parents, believing that my father was truly made a member of the family of God, were parents to him when his own couldn't be. And this was one of the core ways that he became a Christian father, one who, with my Christian mother, who has her own story of becoming a child of God, raised me and my sisters in a Christian home. At some point in my life, I'll be honest, uh, it was when I was sitting where you are, um, my priority was making my faith my own. And I didn't give much credence to the thought that God had been working through family to make me his own. Most of you, I'm sure, have felt in this season the need to own your faith. And this is surely a good impulse and a crucial project. 
Bear in mind, though, that making your faith your own as an emerging adult need not mean that you reject the means by which God has given you the faith you now seek to hold for yourself. Here again, I will speak of my grandparents. They're among the quotidian, the most daily and ordinary ways that God has kept me, despite the tensions and difficulties of this world which threaten my faith and my fidelity. What would be insufficient grounds for faith that my grandparents love Jesus and want me to also turns out to be one of the strong threads by which God binds my wandering heart to himself. A few years back, my grandfather took all these cassette tapes of my grandma, mostly talking to me and my sisters um, in our early childhood, and he burned them onto a CD. Um, these are, of course, family treasures, points of origin for a number of long-standing family jokes, reminders of our early childhood personalities, um, et cetera. Driving to work one day, uh, soon after receiving these CDs, I stumbled upon this um, particular moment, Grandma singing, Oh, How I Love Jesus, with like two-year-old Melissa. And there's this little interview part, it's like, Oh, Melissa, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, I love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? I'm sure I love Jesus. Tell me why you love Jesus. Here's why I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Start sobbing in my car, and the first thought that comes to me, along with all this nostalgia, is I can never stop loving Jesus, because I told my grandma I did when I was two. <laughs> An absurd thought, perhaps but it was truly a moment of blessing for me. And I'll tell you what, if you have no such grandmother, I'm pretty sure mine is wishing right now she could sing Oh How I Love Jesus with each of you if it would remind you as it reminds me how God has made me his daughter. I pray that he will find ways to remind you also. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, what good news that you have made us your children, we believe Help us in our unbelief. For the sake of your dear son, our savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we always pray, amen. You're dismissed. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.